All right. So welcome everyone to UCSF's Cardiology Grand Rounds. We are recording and streaming live to YouTube. I'm honored to be able to present today Dr. Candace Silversides, who will be speaking on the emerging field of cardiobstetrics. Dr. Silversides completed her subspecialty cardiology training at the University of Toronto, where she did fellowships in echocardiography and adult congenital heart disease. She also received a master's of science degree from the Harvard School of Public Health. Currently, Dr. Silversides is a professor of medicine at the University of Toronto and the Miles Nadal Chair in Pregnancy and Heart Disease. She leads the Pregnancy and Heart Disease Program and the Obstetric Medicine Program at the University of Toronto. She's the inaugural editor-in-chief of the American Cardiology, Car College of Cardiology's newest journal, Jack Advances. Her main interests are cardioobstetrics and adult congenital heart disease with more than 200 publications in the field, book chapters and leading cardiology reference texts, including Brown-Waltz heart disease, and contributions to international practice guidelines and consensus statements, including serving as co-chair of the Canadian Cardiovascular Society 2021 guidelines on adult congenital heart disease. She was awarded the Kent Ulin Distinguished Career Award for her role in advancing the field of cardioobstetrics. Welcome, Dr. Silversides. I'm excited to hear your talk, and I see some of our OB colleagues on the line as well, so that's very exciting. And if anyone has questions over the course of the talk, please type them into the chat box, and we'll get to them at the end of the talk. Or if you prefer to keep the questions anonymous, you can also use the Zoom chat function to just direct message me, and I can ask them on your behalf at the end. Dr. Silversides. Excellent. Thanks for the introduction, and um, and thanks for inviting me to be here. So greetings from Canada. And as you heard, I'm going to speak about the emerging field of cardiobstetrics, which is near and dear to my heart. Um, and the reason it's important, I think, just first trying to get your interest, is that 85 to 90 percent of women will have a, well, at least one pregnancy. And although we don't have uh, information about how many women with heart disease have pregnancies, it's probably pretty close. And so it is important, since it's occurring so frequently, for us to understand the implications of pregnancy on the diseased cardiac heart. Um, you know, there recently was an AHA statement, and this is the first slide I just want to show, uh, because this scientific statement did kind of, st the, the writers stuck out their neck and said that a general understanding of cardiovascular disease during pregnancy should be core knowledge for all cardiovascular clinicians, and I would say also all allied health members that deal with women who have heart disease, especially younger women, obviously, of childbearing age. So it is relevant. And, you know, the main cardiology society for you local, you nationally, is saying that it is uh, part of what your core cardiovascular knowledge should be. So with that in mind, that you should know a little bit about this field, I want to just talk about the field briefly, then discuss about the risks of pregnancy for women with heart disease. So, you know, really what you need to know as you see young women with heart disease in your clinic. And finally, I just want to highlight some of what are current standards of care so you're aware of what um, societal guidelines say about how care should be delivered to this population. So starting a little bit about the history of cardiobstetrics, it really kind of came to fruition in the early 1900s when women with rheumatic heart disease were getting into trouble and some cardiovascular specialists actually gained expertise in this field. And most of the women at that time had rheumatic heart disease because obviously it was very prevalent. This is one of the first couple books on pregnancy and heart disease. Um, it was by Sir uh, James McKenzie, a Scottish physician. And if you look at the table of contents, they really all relate to rheumatic heart disease. So MS, aortic valve disease, AFib in the setting of rheumatic heart disease. There's really not much else in this early book on cardioobstetrics. And just to give you a little feel for where a little feel for where this field started, this is one of this. I just pulled out some some of the um, the writing in the book. A lot of it's case case reports or small case series, but this describes a 35-year-old with a pre-systolic murmur uh, of mitral stenosis, came in at seven months gestation with edema. She became, she developed worsening edema over the course of the pregnancy. And then when she came in um, at the time of labor, um, she really was in a lot of distress. She became more, more and more short of breath. 
They tried to deliver her, but she couldn't lie flat for any kind of instrumentation. And ultimately she died. Now, obviously that was back in the day when we didn't have meds or balloon valvuloplasties or other ways to tackle severe mitral stenosis in pregnancy. And it was pretty bleak, but that's where the field started. Then came the population with congenital heart disease. And the reason this was the next big wave of young women of, of childbearing age is that women with more complex forms of congenital heart disease started to survive as surgeries improved. So this is just survival, um, showing survival in women with, and men with tetralogy flow by era. And what you can see is if you look at the different era, you can see the survival, which is on the y-axis, improves. So again, back in the early 1900s, most women with tetralogy flow would not be alive when they hit their 20s, 30s. Well, back in the day, they didn't have ch children in their 40s. But um, you know, during those childbearing years, they wouldn't have been alive. Whereas now, most women, even with you know more complex forms of congenital heart disease like tetralogy of flow, will be alive during their childbearing years, and many will get pregnant. And then finally, what we're seeing more recently is that there's a new wave of women of childbearing age uh, that are delivering. And these are women with acquired heart disease, and that's occurring for a number of reasons. <clears throat> one of which is that maternal age has been increasing for many decades now. This is just data from the United States, um, show, from the CDC showing the change in maternal age over a decade. So the 10 year period is on the X axis, the mean age at first birth of the mums is on the Y axis. And even in only that 10 year interval, you can see there's an increase in maternal age. This is stratified according to urban or rural areas. But as you can see, this has been going on for decades now. And even in a decade, there's a meaningful change. And so with maternal age comes more chronic diseases. And this is an example, you see more pre-pregnancy hypertension in young women who are getting pregnant. This is um, again, that same 10 year interval. This is uh, data from Jack, but it shows um, even in that 10 year interval, the prevalence of pre-pregnancy hypertension has been increasing significantly. And again, this is stratified according to rural or urban location. But again, um, even in short intervals of time, chronic diseases are more prevalent. And then we have other societal issues that are occurring. This just shows maternal weight on the x-axis. You see it stratified according to race or ethnicity. Um, uh, and on the y-axis, you see the percent of women in the blue bars who have obesity or the dark dark light blue bars who have obesity and the dark blue bars uh, who are overweight. But you can see those two categories form at least 50% of the women of childbearing age who are delivering. And with obesity comes other issues like obesity, cardiomyopathy, or increased prevalence of atrial fibrillation and other conditions. So there's all those factors right now that are changing the profile of young women who are, uh, who are pregnant, who have, who have cardiac disease. So what are the actual pregnancy risks? And before I get into the nitty gritty of the, the actual risk in pregnancy, I just wanna put it in context of a woman's life. So I really think you have to think about the lifespan of a woman and the risks that are, that are important factors. So first is just the preexisting heart disease itself. And that may be acquired heart disease, valve disease, cardiomyopathies, inherited arrhythmias, it doesn't matter what, but that, imp that has implications for their life cardiovascular vascular risk. Then you get these acquired superimposed conditions as these women age. So I've showed you examples of hypertension and obesity. And then comes pregnancy. And the reason pregnancy is important is because it, it, it is a hemodynamic load that lasts for 40 weeks that can destabilize someone with pre-existing heart disease. So for anyone that hasn't thought about the physiologic changes of pregnancy, this is supposed to be the perfect storm image, but there is an increase in preload. So you get more blood volume, you get an increase in heart rate. That obviously translates to higher stroke volume and higher cardiac output, which may not be you may not compensate for if you have a cardiomyopathy or if you have a valve lesion, for instance. Um, 
the heart rate may be problematic if you need your diastolic filling time with mitral stenosis or if it uh, predisposes you to an arrhythmia. It's also a prothrombotic state, which can be problematic in women with thromboembolic complications. So for instance, women with atrial arrhythmias or mechanical valve. It's a proarrhythmic state, not only because of the stretch of the ventricles, but the hormones of pregnancy can increase the propensity to arrhythmias. And then some women will have bleeding tendencies, which obviously would be an issue if you were a woman who needed an anticoagulant. So in terms of the whole lifespan risk, this issue with pregnancy and decompensation is also important and can impact the woman's life. And then finally, it's not just about what happens to the cardiovascular system, but also obstetric complications can, um, uh, can impact a woman's cardiovascular risk over the long term. So um, just to mention this very briefly, but as a reminder, um, the placenta is a de novo vascular band. So it is part of the cardiovascular system. And placental dysfunction uh, can result in complications like gestational hypertension, preterm births, preeclampsia, for instance. Um, it's hard to know if women who have uh, abnormal cardiovascular tree develop placental disease because they can't make a normal placenta, or alternatively, if placental disease releases factors into the bloodstream that accelerate cardiovascular disease. But Whatever the cause, we certainly know that if you have these complications in pregnancy, you're more likely to develop cardiovascular disease, not really far away, but in the next one to two decades, so early in life. So this just shows the risk of cardiovascular disease in general and the risks, um, the, um, the increased risks association, associated with various obstetric complications like preeclampsia and obviously severe cre preeclampsia confers a high, higher risk of cardiovascular disease over the next one to two decades after, pre after birth. Preterm births also confer a higher risk, same with stillbirth and low birth weight babies. <clears throat> This is data for cardiovascular disease clumped globally, but also you can look at this, there's higher risk of stroke, higher risk of cardiomyopathies. All these things show up more commonly in women who have obstetric complications during pregnancy. So I wanted to kind of set the stage that, you know, I'm talking about pregnancy, but really it's an important part of thinking about risk for the, your whole future of a cardiac patient going forward. And it's important to integrate all these little bits. Um, but as again, as I said, what I really want to focus on is the pregnancy risk and give you some tools um, and some and knowledge about what you need to know when you're seeing these women in clinic. So the way we typically think about risks for women with cardiac disease is we think about the risk of cardiac destabilization and cardiac complications, obstetric complications, which I've kind of just alluded to, and then perinatal complications. And so the things that are more frequent to happen in women who have pre-existing heart disease are obviously the cardiac complications for, for those related to those physiologic stresses that I've described. The most common complications are arrhythmias and heart failure, but women can also have thromboembolic complications and rarely they can die in pregnancy. Um, some cardiac lesions are associated with higher risks of preeclampsia and eclampsia, which are obstetric complications, or we consider them obstetric complications. So for instance, women with coarctation of the aorta, whether it's repaired or not, um, are more likely to have that type of complication. Some women will be more inclined to bleed, so have postpartum bleeding or antenatal bleeding, and that's typically women on anticoagulants, but there's some congenital lesions like cyanotic heart disease where bleeding is very common, or Fontan, um, fun, women who've had a Fontan operation. And then finally, you know, um, women's health, uh, a mother's health will be highly linked to the health of the fetus and the neonate. And so in general, women with heart disease are more inclined to have perinatal complications. Um, the most common are low birth weight babies and, um, and preterm delivery, which can occur anywhere between 15 to 25% of the time, depending on which series you read, but, but quite common, there's perinatal complications. But for the sake of this talk and for the sake of the fact, I'm mostly speaking to uh, cardiovascular um, team members, I'm gonna focus on the cardiac complications, but recognize uh, there's complications in the obstetric domain and the perinatal domain that are really important to this group of women. <clears throat> 
This is a slide that Matthias Grootman made a number of years ago, but it was just to highlight the, you know, to highlight the, um, the event rates in big cohort series that have been published in women with pre-existing heart disease. So this shows on the x-axis three different large cohort series that have been published. The CARPREG, which is women with congenital and, and acquired heart disease from Canada. This is a Harris study, which is a study from the Netherlands of women with congenital heart disease. And the ROPEX study, which is a multinational study of women with congenital and acquired heart disease. And this on the x-axis, you or on the y-axis, excuse me, you can see the complication rates during pregnancy for cardiovascular complications. And you can see, depending on which series you look look at and how the series is made up of, uh, the event rates vary anywhere between 8% and 15%. And most of those complications are represented by the dark blue bars, which represent heart failure, or the lighter blue bars, which represent primarily arrhythmias. So most women who have pre-existing heart disease, if they're going to get into trouble, it will be heart failure and arrhythmias. And just to give you some examples of kind of complications we see, so again, you get a feel for it. This is one example of a 35-year-old woman who had acute promyeloblastic leukemia. She had received anthracycline, and when she received her anthracycline, she actually dropped her EF to 20%, but eventually over time bounced back. And before she actually had her pregnancy, she had an EF of 60% and was well and had not had, not had any heart failure. Um, but <clears throat> here's what happened to her. So on the left-hand side of your screen, you can see her um, LV before she got pregnant or while she was pregnant. And then she showed up a week after she delivered in clinical heart failure with an EF that you can see is on the right hand of this, on the right hand side of the screen is now severely hypokinetic. So um, presumably that adriamycin cardiomyopathy, even though it recovered, really never left her with a normal myocardium. And the second hit of a prolonged hemodynamic stress on that abnormal myocardium tipped her over the edge. Here's that same woman uh, showing a four chamber view of her LV, but what you can see at the tip of the LV here, hopefully you can see my cursor, is um, a big clot. And so that's probably a combination of the slow sluggish flow, but also the prothrombotic uh, effects of pregnancy. <clears throat> Arrhythmias I've mentioned are also common in women with pre-existing heart disease. Obviously the biggest risk cohort is women with pre-existing arrhythmias or inherited arrhythmias, but also women with structural heart disease. This is a 33 year old G1P0 who had non-obstructive uh, non HCM. She was fine. She just had a very strong family history of uh, sudden death and so had an ICD implanted, which you can see on this echo. And she had been prophylactically put on metoprolol, but never had had any issues till she got pregnant. Then she came in with recurrent syncope at 35 weeks. And actually when she described it to me, I thought it was just kind of pregnancy, run of the mill syncope, vasovagal stuff. But when her device was interrogated, and luckily she did have a device because she had had recurrent PT on device interrogation. So we switched her to a kind of a more potent antiarrhythmic, switched her from metoprolol to sotolol. Soon after that, she went into spontaneous labor and then had more VT. So just highlighting how, um, how pregnancy can destabilize an otherwise stable um, patient. And then finally, my last example is just to show you what can happen if you have an A or topathy. So I've showed you what happens to the ventricles and the, and the um, electrical system, but also um, there's um, increased stretch, uh, stretch on the aorta, plus the hormones of the pregnancy make the wall more lax and women are more inclined to, inclined to dissect when they're pregnant. And this is a 30 year old woman who had Marfan syndrome, who had beta blocker, which we give with the hopes of preventing dissection. But um, uh, nonetheless, she presented with chest pain after she delivered. And you can see this long, long type B dissection in this patient. So those are the types of things that can happen. Um, I've kind of been focusing on maternal morbidity, but I want to highlight maternal mortality uh, just because it's becoming increasingly more important and there's a lot more um, research and work being done on it. Um, so just to highlight it, it is uncommon that women with pre-existing heart disease can die. They can die. But the red bars here represent maternal deaths. And what you can see is when you consider all the potential complications, maternal deaths are actually relatively rare. 
Um, the problem with maternal deaths is it's it's they they still are very problematic because a young woman with many years of life dies as long as well as her baby. And we term it the double tragedy. This was a term coined when Prince Charlotte of Wales, who was like going to be heir to the throne in, um, in the United Kingdom many years ago, but the original Princess Charlotte of Wales gave birth and the baby died and then she died soon after. And the term double tragedy was coined at the time. In fact, it was a triple tragedy because the obstetrician who delivered her all uh, committed suicide after the whole of Britain had been waiting for her to deliver this baby and be heir to the throne and none of it happened. And the country was, uh, was in turmoil after this event. But nonetheless, just kind of highlighting this issue is that it's both the mother and the baby that die during these you know, kind of important years of life. But the real reason that I wanna talk about maternal mortality is this problem in the United States. In the United States for many, many decades now, and unlike most parts of the world, in the United States, maternal mortality has been constantly increasing. In most parts of the world, maternal mortality is getting better and it's been decreasing. And although it's rare, the problem just keeps getting worse. And so there's been a lot of push to try and understand and try and stop this trajectory. What's important from a cardiac perspective is that when you look at why maternal women are dying and increasingly dying during, um, during, uh, during pregnancy, uh, it's due to cardiovascular causes. So this lists the top seven causes of maternal mortality in women during pregnancy. And if you look at these top seven causes, Three of them are related to cardiovascular disease, either cardiovascular coronary events, cardiomyopathies, or preeclampsia, which is a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy, as we all know. So the problem is it is a cardiac problem, and that's why women are dying. I'm just, I'm not going to get into this, but I do want to say there really is important racial and ethnic considerations, and certainly non-Hispanic Blacks are much more inclined to die during pregnancy, and it's a big issue that there's these different racial um, racial risks. This is just data showing maternal mortality from uh, in the United States. It's CDC data, and it's um, stratified according to ethnicity, but you can see compared to non-Hispanic whites, non-Hispanic Blacks have a much, much higher um, chance of dying during pregnancy. Now, the other thing that's a bit different about maternal mortality, unlike morbidity, where it often happens in women with known pre-existing heart disease, more, maternal mortality often happens in women who didn't know they had cardiac disease before they got pregnant. So I'm going to show you some examples. And I want you to try just to break up this talk, figure out what these women had and what was missed. So this is a a woman who had a history of unexplained collapse. Um, she had been sent to neurologists. They couldn't find any mm -hmm. cause. She actually had an ECG. The QT was quite long on the ECG, but nobody referred her for anybody for further investigations. Then she had her second child. She died soon after she delivered. What do you think the cause of her death was? So she had long QT. You just have to think of it in your mind. Unfortunately, I didn't uh, get polls here, but she had long QT. It was diagnosed on genetic testing on her postpartum exam. And as many of you know, long QT, at least early postpartum, will increase your risk of dying, especially long QT too. And it, that risk can be totally mitigated, not totally, but very well can be significantly decreased with beta blockers. So it's a missed opportunity, not only to make the diagnosis, but also to provide an effective treatment. So let's see if you can get this, this one. This is a woman who was uh, breathless in her third trimester and she went to the hospital. I should have mentioned, these are examples from the maternal confidential inquiries into maternal death that are published from the UK every three years. In fact, confidential inquiries are actually, um, were, were really, they've been done in the UK for 70 years. North America was very far behind doing confidential inquiries and trying to learn from deaths and trying to improve the system to prevent deaths, but there's been a big push to improve 
um, confidential inquiries in the US and certainly California has been leader, uh, really a leader in this field. But anyways, we're back to the UK examples because they're well described in the literature, but she came in breathless in the third trimester. She was told, patted on the back, told it was just because she had anemia sent on her way. Then she comes in to deliver, but now in a preterm in preterm labor, she's increasingly breathless. Now she's tachypnic, tachycardic. When they examine her, she's wheezy, but they think it's just because she she's wheezy. She's a young woman with wheezes. Nobody clues into pulmonary edema, but she's got pulmonary edema. They even do blood gases, which are abnormal, but everybody's so worried about the delivery, they don't pay attention to the abnormal blood gases. And she delivers, then she collapses and she dies. What do you think the cause of her death was? So she had peripartum cardiomyopathy. Sorry, I hope some of you guys are guessing it in your head. Um, but she had peripartum cardiomyopathy. She, you know, she had otherwise been well, then comes in with heart failure near the tail end of her pregnancy and then um, dies from it early after. And again, this is potentially a preventable death. Here's my last example. Um, this is a condition that in, it is more common during pregnancy. So a woman who sm smoke comes into the emergency department with chest pain, somewhat atypical, but still somewhat anginal sounding chest pain and shortness of breath. And it occurred, started up after she delivered. Um, even though she's complaining of chest pain, it's somewhat atypical. They do an ECG, it's normal. And because of her age, presumably in the quality of the pain, nobody does serial ECGs, nobody does tropes. They, again, send her on her way. She gets discharged and she dies soon after she's discharged. Any thoughts on chest pain in a pregnant woman and why she might have died? So she had a spontaneous coronary artery dissection or SCAD. And those are just some examples of uh, maternal mortality and what type of conditions we see in young women of childbearing age. But I want to go back to this slide. You know, the slide I showed you earlier, it's from the United States looking at causes of maternal mortality from nine states. But an important part of this graphic that I didn't show you earlier, but I'm showing you now, whoops, excuse me, is where they actually adjudicated the mortality to decide if it was preventable or not. And of the cardiovascular deaths, almost 70% were preventable. And kind of similar to those cases I just showed you from the confidential inquiries, where you can envision if things were caught earlier, perhaps the maternal death could have been prevented. So I think there's room to improve. And as I said, um, of all places in North America, um, California is really le leading the charge on trying to um, detect um, uh, women at risk and put some measures in place to uh, treat these women earlier. With all that in mind, though, uh, a number of years ago, there was a call to action. This was a commentary in circulation. And I think there's been increasing traction even since this was published eight years ago, but really trying to draw attention to not just the cardiac community, but to the medical community as a whole, that we really do need to do something about these maternal cardiovascular deaths. And I couldn't really mention maternal mortality without mentioning morbid, uh, with my mentioning mortality on a global scale. I'm only going to show you this one slide, but this is a world map as we know it, geographical world map. This is a world map according to maternal mortality. And although, you know, you can see over on the left-hand side of the map is um, North America where maternal mortality is rare. So we're represented as a tiny little skinny country, but maternal mortality on a global scale is much more common in other countries. And, and certainly uh, cardiovascular mortality is important in many countries. And so I think we have lots to do on a big scale. So there are standards of care because of this problem. And um, I've already show, mentioned this standard of uh, this document that was published by AHA on cardiovascular considerations in pregnant patients. And I've already told you that part of it says that all cardiologists or allied health professionals working in the field of cardiovascular medicine should have some understanding of this field. Uh, but they also say that preconception counseling is essential for women with pre-existing heart disease and preconception counseling will be done by cardiologists. So this is stuff that you need to know.
So I ask you, when you're seeing women in your cardiac clinics, how often are you thinking, women of childbearing age to be more specific, how, are you, how often are you thinking, I better mention pregnancy and what the risks are so that if they don't want to get, so that they can make an informed decision about whether or not they want to get pregnant, if they don't want to get pregnant because those risks are not acceptable, so they can be on appropriate contraception, or even so that they understand what would need to be done should they get pregnant. Well, I think people overlook it a lot, and I can tell you there's been a number of studies that say we overlook it a lot in the cardiac clinic, but I'm doing this talk with the hopes that I remind you next time you see a young woman in your clinic, you can talk about pregnancy risks. So I want to give you a little bit of tools for how to tackle that conversation and adjudicate the risk for someone with pre-existing heart disease. So I'm going to walk you through what I think is at least one way to tackle this risk stratification. And this is um, just um, uh, uh, a strategy that um, Sam Sue, who's another cardiobstetrics researcher, and I published in Brunwald. So I think the first thing to do is figure out, is does this woman have a high-risk lesion? So high-risk lesions are pulmonary hypertension, peripartum cardiomyopathy, where they never had full recovery of their EF. If they have um, cardiomyopathy with an EF less than 30%, if they have severe symptomatic AS or MS, if they have aortopathies like Marfan's with dilated roots that are high risk for dissecting, or if they have um, uh, uh, a history of an aortic or coronary dissection. If they have one of those conditions, luckily there's not too many, but you do have to commit these to memory because if they have one of these conditions, maternal morbidity and mortality are extremely high. And the recommendation is that you advise women not to become pregnant and you also provide them with appropriate safe and reliable contraception so they can avoid a pregnancy. So that's a starting point. And that's in some ways the easiest because if they have one of these lesions, the general advice is try and avoid pregnancy. It gets a little trickier if they don't fall into that bucket list because then I think you have to use a few different tools. You can look at what kind of lesion they have, we have risk scores to help us sort out the risk. You have to integrate patient-specific variables, and it is more complex. Certainly, if you're not comfortable with it, um, you, there's lots of clinics around where you can refer to, and people will help sort that out. But, um, uh, but, um, but I do think there's tools, and I'm going to give you one tool to use, which is called the CARPREG risk score. And I'm going to um, talk about that in a little bit more detail in a moment. But I do want to mention, when you integrate the risk score and those other clinical variables, hopefully you can sort out whether women are low risk, intermediate risk, or even if they are high risk with maybe something that doesn't fall into that original list I showed you, and then provide pregnancy advice. But I'm going to do to her for a moment before because I want to talk about risk scores. And this was a piece that was written in the New York Times a number of years ago. And they start the piece by saying there are brief periods of time when old routines fall apart and per particularly buying habits are suddenly in flux. So you might be shopping at new places and a particularly important time is when you have a kid. You might start going to a different store and start, you know, you're buying diapers and who knows what. And so stores are buying for your business at this time because things are in flux. And Target tried to use that to their advantage. So Target did a study. And Target assigns every shopper a unique code that, is, that identifies what they buy. Then they had statisticians look at what people were buying, and they used this information to create a pregnant a score to predict pregnancy. Because remember, if they could predict who was pregnant, there's maybe ways they could target that audience so, or target that those shoppers. So for instance, you could send them flyers and say, here's diapers on sale or whatever else you want to target them to try and get them in your store and use and and um and make them your customer. And they actually identified 25 products. It's things like non-scented shampoo, because you know you don't want to get chemicals to a baby in utero. And so people will often switch from scented to non-scented hand products and shampoos and other things. And it's a number of products, but they identified products that could identify which women not were delivering, but which were pregnant. Um, and it turns out their pregnancy risk score um, could identify if a woman was pregnant with 87% um, 
accuracy. So then they would target women, send them, send them flyers and try and get them to go to Target. What's interesting, well, the story goes on to just say how it caused some kerfuffle in a family where a young woman hadn't disclosed to her parents that she was pregnant. They Target started sending her all these flyers and they figured it out and it caused trouble. But the bottom line and the reason I'm doing this is just to highlight these risk scores. So Target obviously used it, but in the world of cardiobstetrics, we tend to use risk scores to look at what's the chance of running into cardiovascular complications while you're pregnant. I just thought the Target story was interesting, but we have a similar type of risk score, but the risk score here, which I said I would mention, is called the CARPREG, Cardiac Disease and Pregnancy Risk Score. It, uh, there was an original one. This is a modified version that more recently came out. And what it does is it uses baseline, uh, baseline factors related to women with heart disease and tries to predict their chance of getting into trouble in pregnancy. Again, you know, mostly developing heart failure arrhythmias. You can see it's, uh, it has 10 predictors in this model. It's a weighted risk score. So it's a bit complicated to use, but the, more, the, bottom, the gist of it is the more points you get based on these risk predictors, the more likely you are to run into trouble. And this graphic just shows the point score on the bottom and the chance of running into um, cardiac complications on the y-axis. And obviously the more you have, the more likely you are to run into trouble. I don't think you have to remember every bit of this weighted risk score, which I said is complicated, but you should remember some principles. So the things that are driving adverse outcomes are in this risk score. The first is take a history. Excuse me. If women have had heart failure or had arrhythmias, they're more likely with the hemodynamic stress of pregnancy to have them during pregnancy. That's a point on the risk score, three points on the risk score. If women have poor functional class, they're more likely to get into trouble. There is lots of data that say if you start behind the eight ball when you get pregnant, you're more likely to decompensate. And obviously that's, you have poor functional class for many reasons. Then after you take the history, after you do that physical exam, go to an echo. If you have ventricular dysfunction or pulmonary hypertension, more trouble to run into pregnancy. Uh, more trouble to run into pregnancy complications. Then there's just some high-risk lesions that I've kind of alluded to already, but these aren't quite in that super high-risk category, all of them that I've mentioned before. But if you have a mechanical valve, if you have coronary disease, a high-risk aortopathy, sorry, I've color-coded this wrong. It should be left-sided obstructive valves should be in red, but those are the specific high-risk lesions. And then there was a very interesting aspect uh, uh, predictor that we found on this risk score that late delivery of care was associated with that worse outcome. So it was the first time one of these risk scores identified that delivery of care was important, independent of all these other variables. So again, you know, it's what you would always do, a history of physical, get your echo, understand there's some really high risk lesions, and then... Um, and then integrate them. The more of those you have, the more likely you are to run into trouble. So just as an example, if you had a woman who had had heart failure before, had even say mild or moderate dysfunction and never got into clinical care, she would be much more likely to run into troubles during pregnancy. And if you tallied up her risk points on this risk score, she would have a risk score of six and she would fall into that high risk category where almost half those women would um, run into troubles during pregnancy. Now, this is my last point about risk in pregnancy, but risk is, you know, um, very patient specific. And some women, even a low risk for pregnancy complications will not be palatable. And other women who have very high pregnancy risk will be so determined and they feel it's so important that they have a pregnancy that even telling them they have a mortality of 20 or 30% won't deter them from having a pregnancy. So, you know, again, your job is to convey the information about what the risk is in pregnancy, but ultimately that risk tolerance will be dictated by the patient who will then decide if that risk is acceptable or not. And then you have to support them in their decision and do your best to get them through a pregnancy if they are high risk. So I'm coming down the last stretch, but just I wanted to highlight a few aspects of standards of care that I want you to take home with you. And the first is that preconception counseling is essential. So it is important, again, when you see women in your clinic to at least 
touch on pregnancy um, so they understand uh, the risks of pregnancy and you can take precautions to avoid it if it's necessary. Um, it is recommended that anybody with intermediate or high risk uh, for complications in pregnancy be treated at a specialized center by a multidisciplinary pregnancy heart team. It come, this comes in all the guidelines. And the reason that's the case is because these are some of the things that need to be um, done for a pregnant woman with cardiovascular disease while they're pregnant. So they may need the preconception counseling. If they haven't got it, you need to talk about it when you see them at the first antenatal visit. They may need genetic testing if they have an inherited arrhythmia, inherited aortopathy, whatever, congenital heart disease. You have to figure out how much clinical surveillance they need during the pregnancy at the time of labor and delivery and postpartum, depending on their lesion. They'll need serial imaging in most cases, unless they're a very low risk lesion. They'll also need the fetus check. Certainly if they have an inherited condition, you need to do fetal echocardiograms. You may need placental ultrasound if you're worried about fetal growth and development. Then the obst obstetric team will do antenatal testing. You have to plan delivery, the type of uh, anesthetic you'll use, the type of monitoring you use, where you'll monitor them postpartum. And then you have to figure one, uh, when they walk out of hospital, how are you going to monitor them so that you make sure they have early or uh, appropriate postpartum care, again, tailored to their lesion. But you can get the gist of it. This is complicated. It takes teams from multidisciplines. And so that's really why you need a multidisciplinary team. And just like the aortic valve team or the PCI team that exists nowadays, there is a cardioobstetric team that, um, that needs to be assembled to care for this uh, cohort of women properly. And, um, you know, it not only includes the cardiologist, but it would include the high risk uh, maternal fetal medicine specialist, the obstetricians, OB anesthetists, or cardiac anesthetists. Uh, certainly, uh, the nurses are critical to delivering care appropriately to this high risk population. As they, as, as everyone knows, they're they're the front line. And then you may may not need different subspecialties like cardiac imaging, fetal imaging, neonatology, genetics, social work, pharmacy, etc. You have an excellent team. I found out when I looked it up. It's all um, it's all online, but the UCSF team is made up of uh, really some fantastic specialists in this field. So I feel you're very lucky locally because you have expect um, experts that are really recognized on a national and international level. And this is the last point I want to make, which is, <clears throat> you know, we can assemble these teams, but does this really help? to improve the care of patients. And so um, this is a study we did. It's a multi-center study in Canada. And we looked at whether or not um, really getting one of these cardiobstetric clinics would help to improve care. And in Toronto, we had been seeing patients for decades um, with heart disease, um, in part because we have a large congenital program, which is how it started, although now it's, it's often acquired heart disease. <clears throat> but when we started, um, you know, they were seen at one hospital, delivered, at, delivered but the team really wasn't unified to, and, and uh, delivery of care wasn't unified to one-stop shopping. But in the year 2000, we started a cardiobstetrics clinic. So the MFM and the cardiologists were all in one place. Uh, we also had ECG, echo, we had all the fetal scans done. Um, we had patients seen independently by the two groups, but uh, we had one unifying room where we would discuss cases. We started doing regular rounds with the whole group and including OB anesthesia. And so in the year 2000, we developed a formal proper program. So the blue bars represent before the program was developed the red bars represent after. On the x-axis, you can see the different types of complications, but the ones I'm showing here just are all complications. So again, predominantly heart failure and arrhythmias. And what you can see is we didn't really make much difference even after we spent all this time. Yeah, slightly different, but not that much better. And if you look at it, we didn't really improve arrhythmias. However, we did cut the rates of de women developing pulmonary edema by about half. So I don't know if we can fix everything, but it looks like maybe we can improve some things. And at least with our clinic, we prevented some complications of pulmonary edema. And probably we had a slightly decrease in maternal mortality overall as well. And so 
I'm going to remind you the things I talked about that I want you to remember when you walk away today. First of all, that this field of cardiobstetrics is growing and we're learning a lot more and we understand a lot more. Uh, but certainly the, there's an evolution in part because the population is changing. Cardiologists are responsible for patient counseling regarding pregnancy risks as it relates to the cardia, cardiovascular system. And there are tools available if you don't do this all the time to help you out. Um, there are standards of care, not only um, for preconception counseling, but also how to deliver care to this population. Um, and it is important um, that we follow these to try and optimize pregnancy outcomes for these women. So again, thanks so much for letting me be here and, and for listening. And um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Dr. Silversides. That was such a great talk. I really enjoyed the historical aspect you brought to the talk and the cases you shared and the tools that made it very practical for us to think about how we can improve our delivery of care to these women. Um, so it looks like Dr. Goldschlager has several questions. Um, Dr. Goldschlager, are you able to unmute yourself to ask the questions? If not, I can read them off. Um, I'll probably um, not read them as well as you. Go ahead. And that way you can eliminate some that you feel are too many. <laughs> okay, no, I think that these are all great questions. So um, first she had asked um, if you could perhaps summarize the approach to antiarrhythmics in pregnant patients. You know, are there certain medications that are okay, probably okay versus absolutely contraindicated for use as an antiarrhythmic in a, in a pregnant patient? Yeah, so um, first of all, I'm gonna say there's a really lovely Jack summary of not just antiarrhythmics, but all cardiac meds in the pregnant population. Um, it's a number of years ago, it's by Dan Halperin, but it's excellent. So, um, so if you need a resource, it's out there. If not, the ESC guidelines on pregnancy and cardiovascular disease are another great reference. But as a summary, um, you know, um, the real, the really the ones that we have the most experience in are digoxin, which, you know, most of the time you're not going to use except in rare instances and beta blockers, which we use for many things, but often for arrhythmias as a starting point. Um, and we know they're not teratogenic. They do have, um, they do have some downsides, you know, they can impact fetal growth. So you should need to keep a, an eye on growth. They can impact the fetal and neonatal heart rate, and they can um, result in increased rates of uh, neonatal hypoglycemia. Glycemia. But nonetheless, they're not teratogenic. And so we use beta blockers a lot. Um, most of the other antiarrhythmics, there's not great pregnancy data. And so, you know, there's an old classification called the FDA classification, which says, well, we don't know they're teratogenic. Use them only if you don't have other options. And so almost all other antiarrhythmics fall into that category to use during pregnancy, with the exception of one, which is amiodarone. So amiodarone can cause fetal hyp uh, hypo or hyperthyroidism. And, you know, hypothyroidism in a fetus can cause cretinism. And so um, amiodarone is the one that we tend to avoid, if at all possible, because of that thyroid issue in the fetus. Now, that being said, there's sometimes where you actually still, I'm just going to say, if there's times where women might have very bad ventricular tachycardia and structural heart disease. And at least in Canada, that may be our best option uh, to treat it. So it's not like it hasn't been used, but that one you would try and not use at all costs. So, you know, again, most of the antiarrhythmics have limited data, um, but apart from amiodarone, though, they can be used if they need to be used. Um, I, uh, so maybe I'll leave it at that. Um, I would say if you're if you're thinking of which antiarrhythmic to use and you've kind of gone beyond kind of the simple beta blocker issue, well, I'll come calcium. I should mention calcium channel blockers because women are also often on those for SVTs. Um, it, the issue with calcium channel blockers is diltiazem, and it's a study in animals, but there is some some data in animals that perhaps it can affect bone. Development and so they they tend to say if you can you know avoid diltiazem and find an alternative do so but again sometimes a woman's well controlled on diltiazem so uh, again it's only in an animal model and so um, certainly there's there's a number of women that have been on diltiazem but I'm kind of rambling here um, uh, I I still think the best bet is look up uh, the medication that you want to use and see if it's safe because. Also, our information about drugs in pregnancy does evolve.
That's great. And then the next question is, are EKGs a standard of practice in pregnant patients? It seems like, for example, in the case of the long QT patient that you'd shared, um, perhaps, you know, screening EKG would be helpful um, and then incorporating that potentially into the risk score. Um, has there been consideration for getting EKGs in all pregnant patients? Let me, I, I will say I am very biased in this regard because I'm a big fan of baseline ECGs in the entire world. But here, since especially your data that you showed arrhythmia um, man or mortality from morbidity from over time has not really come down all that much. And I'm just wondering if, uh, which I think it should be, an ECG should be part of standard of practice and risk score. So that's my bias. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the pro the, I guess, you know, most of them are going to be in sinus rhythm with few exceptions. I guess you're talking about looking at QT intervals and, you know, those kinds of things. So um, I guess the problem is the denominator is so big. You've got hundreds of thousands of healthy women. And are you really going to do it in everybody? We do it in everybody with heart disease every time they come in for a clinic visit. Um, but um, uh, a clinic visit when they're pregnant. Um, but to do it uh, as a baseline of the whole population, I mean, I think somebody would actually probably have to look and see if that's cost effective. I mean, you may or may not be correct. You may be correct. Maybe it is somehow cost effective. But just to implement that on a big scale, I, I think is a little tricky. And whether or not it's, it's effective is another question. Um, certainly, though, any, I mean, palpitations are common in pregnancy, but for sure, any woman that complains of arrhythmia symptoms should have ECG. And, you know, um, one of the members of my cardiobstetrics group is uh, actually, yeah, one of them is a, an arrhythmia specialist, and she would advocate that anybody with any symptoms also has Holters. So um, probably they should have an ECG and a Holter if they have symptoms. But as a screening tool, um, I think it's a great question for sure. I just don't have an answer for you. I'm thinking about stuff like LVH, you know, something which would predispose to something that's not really apparent in a pregnant physical exam. So, yeah. I, you know, I, I see your point absolutely. On the other hand, uh, when the, if and when they do get into trouble, you don't have a baseline ECG to look at. Just, just my bias. Yeah. I mean, maybe, you know, as these Apple watches and various tools get better, everybody will have their ECG recorded somewhere anyways. But I mean, it is an interesting thought because, you know, women, when they're pregnant, they're in the healthcare system. And this is the time, you know, they might not be before they're pregnant. You might not see them for many years after, but you have this small little opportunity where they're in the healthcare system. And, and you know, your, your thought of trying to use that to identify things even beyond perhaps pregnancy itself, but to identify conditions. I mean, it is an optimal time to pick things up. It's just how to do it. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a great thought. Okay, great. And then uh, Peggy, did you wanna unmute yourself to ask your question? If not, I can answer, ask it for you as well. Sure, and this goes to kind of what you were just talking about, uh, Dr. Selvasides, with it's an opportunity for patients to, to get into care for other than just the pregnancy. And one of my question was, um, a lot of patients are presenting, even patients with prior cardiac conditions are presenting to outside OBs, community OBs, and they're not currently in cardiology care. So yeah, absolutely. the guidelines you should were for AHA and, and ACC, and we're all on board. Uh, what's the way of communicating to local OBs, community OBs, what the protocol should be for screening patients who come in with palpitations or shortness of breath, screening and referral at the OB level, and how do we uh, communicate better with our community OBs? You know, even folks coming yeah, so in with sternotomy scars and saying, oh, I had a hole when I was a baby and now it's fixed. <laughs> and they're showing up, you know, already yeah. pregnant. Yeah, and it's, I guess, beyond OBs too, because a lot of those cases that you see um, in maternal mortality reviews are women coming into emerged, uh, emergency rooms and other places. So yeah, you know, most of it's, I mean, for some bits of care, it does lay with the cardiologist, but lots of the stuff is outside, outside our clinics. So um, California is actually making a big push to create these toolboxes that are used in emergency rooms and 
and uh, you know triage centers where they have a the toolbox includes some red flags. If you have a certain number of red flags, then it screens you in. Some of them are even implemented in EMRs. It screens you in, says this person needs another cardiac test, and then you're supposed to kind of go down an algorithm. And I have to say, um, there is a number of uh, MFMs from. Uh, from UC, UC Irvine and elsewhere in California. California will lead the charge on this and they're just starting to implement it on bigger scales. So, um, so I think it's coming and for that exact reason, it's coming not to our offices, but to, to triage centers, to EDs, other places, acute care settings where that triage, that toolbox will helpfully help non-cardiologists think about cardiac disease in the in the in young women at childbearing age, where usually it's so low on the list of the differential, right? And Dr. Moslehi had a question to ask as well. Are you able to unmute and ask? Yes, uh, we're actually sitting here with Amir and YC to our fellows. I really excellent talk, really great overview, really good uh talk i have a couple of more logistical questions if someone's interested in this area do you for example need a congenital heart disease expertise before you do cardioobstetrics and in terms of more globally within a, a cardiology program do you think it's part of cardioobstetrics is part of women's heart disease is it the same i just wanted to if you have some pragmatic thoughts for us our fellows and so forth who are interested in this area. And I think with the one thing that really jumped at me is, do you need to have a congenital heart expertise? Because again, a subset of patients do have uh, 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 congenital heart disease. Uh, so that, I guess that's the question. Yeah, I mean, Thanks again. Yeah, that's a very good question, because I'll tell you something I've noticed. There, this field has evolved so much. When I started, I would say you actually need it because so many of the patients had congenital heart disease. That's not the case anymore. Women have inherited arrhythmias, aortopathies, cardiomyopathies, others, you know, the cardiologists are starting to tackle preeclampsia, which historically has been managed by the, um, the MFM. So, um, so I would say you don't need it anymore. And certainly, so I come, the center I come from, we have a, a big cardiobstetric clinic and you know, 15, 20 years ago, most 90% was congenital heart disease. Now maybe 55% is congenital heart disease, the rest is acquired. And so for instance, in our group, there's people that do acquired heart disease, there's people that do inherited arrhythmias or people that do congenital heart disease, but you just need to find the team. So it helps to have congenital heart disease for sure, but I don't think it's necessary if you can find a working environment where your expertise can be tapped into. Um, and certainly not everybody that knows congenital heart disease is good at acquired heart disease. What you want is physicians that look after the condition outside of pregnancy and therefore are also skilled to look at it inside pregnancy. And so just because you know congenital heart disease, if you're not a heart failure doc and you don't see cardiomyopathies, then that's not going to be your strength looking after a pregnant woman with an EF of 30%. You know, better an acquired doc do that. So it's kind of, you know, you have to find your population. And I said, in some ways, it's nice being in a center that I'm from. We have five uh, docs that do cardiobstetrics, and each of them has their own little niche, and we just triage referrals so the, the smartest person sees the patient that's most appropriate. So that's how I would tackle it. But it's congenital is helpful, but probably not necessary with the way things are changing in the population. That's great. And Dr. Agarwal had questions as well. Hi, I know we are on, already on top of the hour, but Candice, really nice to see you. It was amazing. And what a fantastic talk. <laughs> um, you know, just to piggyback on your last comment, uh, even at UCSF, if you look at our entire pregnancy database, we have about 50% of them as congenital and about 50% who are non-congenital patients. Uh, I interest. There you go. You're look a perfect step. See how smart. Um, <laughs> but so there's there's room for everybody depending on your expertise. And I would have said, you know, interesting, when I started, we didn't need an inherited arrhythmia specialist. And now her clinic's blown up because 20 years ago, you know, there was long QT and that's about it. And now there's a lot more understanding of the genetics, the pregnancy risks, a lot more nuances to inherited arrhythmias. So this will change. And in all of our 
rest of our career, we're, we're likely to see more changes in this field, but that's why it's fun. So anybody young, I would encourage you to get into it. It's a great field, but. Um, you know, I have a question on uh, the risk scores. So as you, I mean, what have I, who am I to tell you, but all the risk scores, you know, develop in Canada. So when you go and give a talk to people who are not in Canada, uh, whether they are in developed- yeah, They're useless, they're well. useless. So like, how do yeah. you, because we look at our data and validation of risk scores, it's not yet submitted for publication. We're just still working on an analysis. And it was interesting that we saw that uh, the, the lower scores in our patient population did worse and the higher score, the patients who fall into the higher scores did better. And I wonder whether there was some tertiary center bias where, you know, we see a much oh, more yeah. complex lower score patients, which also relates yeah, to your last sure. slide. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the problem with all these risk scores is they're good for the population at hand that you study. Um, you know, um, for instance, I work with a group in Kenya. Our risk score is just not useful. What they need is a specific risk score for patients with rheumatic heart disease. And in fact, one has been developed in India. It's called the Debbie score. And it's for all women coming into their cardiobstetric clinics, but that's 95% of them have rheumatic heart disease. And so the risk score is relevant for their population. And, and perhaps your population, you know, uh, UCSF is different. I would have thought a big referral center in a North American city aren't too, too different, but, you know, I, I just, risk scores are what they are. I wouldn't, I, I mean, having even developed one, I think they're useful. They're a good starting point to understand what is the main factors driving adverse outcomes, but you know, figuring out somebody's risk takes a lot of nuance and we can keep making these risk scores up the yin yang, or we can all just use good clinical sense, understand what are the things that seem to be associated with poor outcome and then integrate it into, you know, add clinical judgment. But um, the risk scores are tough. They're not perfect. And they, you know, sure, they've, you know, they've been validated in other groups and not validated in other groups. And we keep looking at them, but I don't know how many more times we should keep doing it versus just, tr again, trying to take away general principles. Thank you. And, and we've had such great questions. Thanks all for submitting them. Um, I, we're going to round it out with a last question from Dr. Sabanayagam. Um, did you want to unmute yourself and ask? Oh, thanks, Dr. Silverside. This was a great, great talk. Uh, very happy to have you here. And I'm, I'm glad that the fellows have a session with you after this. So my question for you, and this is sort of like, you know, coming on the heels of a patient we just had recently who was a renal transplant patient you know, who presented with preeclampsia and then two months later, raging pulmonary arterial hypertension, you know, PBR of 7.5. And so I was interested in your thoughts, you know, with this overlap, you know, with preeclampsia, peripotent cardiomyopathy, maybe like, you know, from a vascular biology standpoint, possibly pulmonary arterial hypertension. Like, do you, does your program have a protocol in terms of immediate post, you know, postpartum follow-up? I mean, we do know that those who come with preeclampsia are at increased risk for acquired heart disease, you know, and increased cardiovascular um, issues later on in life, but in the, kind of like the immediate postpartum, you know, um, follow-up period. Is there a way like you manage these patients, you know, from the cardiology standpoint? Again, we have sort of like always, you know, um, had our uh, MFM call and, on a, and our OB colleagues follow, you, follow these patients, but should we be doing something different on the cardiology side? I'm just curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, it could be cardiology. The way we do it here is um, GIM that is specialized in obstetric medicine. So they've done extra training in pregnancy. They tend to run with preeclampsia and the MFMs. And obviously it's severe, you know, depending on the severity of preeclampsia, they'll see them all very early after they deliver. And then we just started a post uh, preeclampsia clinic that follows them over the long term you know, months after they deliver and then yearly kind of picking up all those women that are high risk for cardiac complications and hoping to risk or to um, identify those at highest risk and, 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 you know, treat risk factors and try and prevent some of the, the um, disease trajectory. But I don't know. I mean, you know, I think it should be somebody that that does this and has time and finds it interesting. And so, as I said here, it's GIM and nephrology that have run with the preeclampsia thing, but certainly at some places it'll be cardi cardiology that decides to set up that program. So it really depends who your local preeclampsia expert is, but there is no doubt they need close follow-up. 
um, early after, and then some kind of follow-up for risk factor modification, especially in those with severe preeclampsia. Thank you, appreciate that. All right, well, thank you again, Dr. Silverside, so much for a fantastic talk. We're gonna have a recording of this that, that'll be up on our division's YouTube page. So for most folks, feel free to go ahead and log off. Um, for fellows, we do have a chance to speak with Dr. Silversides one-on-one -on -one using this same Zoom link. So just stay on the line. We're going to take a five-minute break. So maybe at 1.15, we can reconvene um, for our own separate session. Okay, well, goodbye.